We're talking about leadership principles in the book of Exodus, very important to the health and life of a church. And um, we're going to talk this morning about some unsung leaders. And uh, first we're going to read the scripture, and then James is going to come with another song. Let me read this for you. This is Exodus chapter 2. About that time, a man, and, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and she gave birth to a son. She saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Soon Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river and her attendants walked along the bank. When the princess saw the baskets among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. The little boy was crying. She felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby? Should I find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. The girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother. I will pay you for your help. So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of the water. This morning we're going to talk about Moses and some of the events around him being born. So let's bow our heads together and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. Heavenly Father, we desire to know you. And little by little and step by step, we're learning things that help us understand you better and help us find principles that help us govern our lives and have influence and impact on the world. We want to do that. We want to be the best we can be for you, and we want to honor and glorify you. And so we ask that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There went out a man from the house of Levi and took, out a, took a wife. He didn't take out his wife. That would have been bad. Um, it tells of Moses that he was a goodly child. In this case, that doesn't mean he was well-behaved. It meant he looked exceptional. When you looked at him, you just thought, wow, this child is really something else. Now, I think that's kind of humorous because isn't that what every mother does in regard to their child? <laughs> but somehow Moses was different. And I imagine that when you saw him growing, you could just tell that there was something in the way he carried himself that uh, made him look like Charlton Heston. Um, oh, but we recognize that in life, that there are people who look impressive and there are people who are normal. So this child was unique from the beginning. God had a purpose for him. God had not forgotten the people in spite of the fact that they'd been in bondage. And certainly they must have felt in large measure like God had forgotten. And that's not be hard on them. That's normal human behavior. When we go through long trials, it can be easy to have at least moments where you question. And the stories like this are really illustrative of what goes on in our lives today. They're intended to teach us lessons about our own lives, our own hearts, and the way we govern ourselves. So it says, the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him, she saw that he was a goodly child, and she hid him three months. Now the Bible mentions this three times, and repetition in the Bible is always for emphasis. God never runs 
a lot of things to say. He never gets confused in his notes and repeats. Uh, God, when he repeats, there's emphasis for a reason. So three times in the Bible we, we see this. I'm going to show you a second time, and you'll have to find the third one on your own for sake of time. But um, this appears to motivate them. Now, you know the backstory. Pharaoh had decreed that the male children were to be killed. And apparently this was a common practice. The, the families apparently felt they had no choice. Children were taken by force. But there was something about Moses that made it clear to these parents that they needed to go out of their way to hide him. And it would be a terrible challenge to try to hide a small child. Now, when you look at Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 is an is uh, important passage in the New Testament because it's basically a Hall of Fame chapter. It lists person after person who was an example of great faith. And some of them you would think of as people of great faith and some of them you wouldn't. But it says this about Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months by his parents. So these were people of unique faith. Um, they thought they understood God's purpose and they did whatever they could to fulfill it. Um, but they saw that he was, again, a goodly child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. I have to say, that's really bold. A lot of times we obey God and we're uncertain. Sometimes we obey God and we're afraid it isn't going to work out. It says they obeyed God and they weren't even fearful. So we may look at them as simple people in a simple time, but the truth is they had remarkable faith. I, I, when I think of my children, I hope for many things, but as a Christian, not as a pastor, as a Christian, I hope that God will say and my children will recognize that their mother and I were people of faith, that we took our opportunity seriously, that we did our best to serve the Lord, and even though we had ups and downs and successes and failures, hopefully God will look on that and say, yes, welcome, good and faithful servant, and I would love to give that as a heritage to my children, and I know many of you would like to give that as a heritage to your children. And, and I want to say, you know, we have people in the room who are relatively new Christians. And before you were Christians, your life was maybe a little more careless. I don't think God's focused on that. I think forgiveness is a real thing, and I think we have a fresh start and a fresh opportunity. So um, God notices faithfulness. And so if you go forward in your life and you're a faithful person, I believe that'll be his testimony about you as well. Now, we're talking about leadership in these stories because it's easy to focus on the one. It's easy to focus on Moses. We've all seen movies about Moses. Most of us watch at least part of the Ten Commandments at Easter and we see Charlton Heston standing there all dignified, you know, and, and he is impressive. I give him credit. And uh, boy, the movie's touching and it's terrific. But you know what? For every Moses, you have thousands, maybe millions of people who go about their daily lives and nobody notices. You know, I think that's one of the purposes of the, of the genealogies of the Bible. It names this person after this person who begat this person and this person and this person. And you think, why in the world? And I think God's trying to tell us that you who go to work every day and you're faithful and you seem to be just filling a role and you don't feel like you're noticed, but God notices. God notices all that we do and he regards that highly. And I believe there's no greater leadership opportunity than your child. And second to that is the children of others. When we encourage you in your parenting, 
where we encourage you to be involved in Sunday school or children's church, I believe that's vitally important to a society. If you study the Jewish life, one of the reasons their families and their children were successful generation after generation is because they focused on that success. And parents were taught to lead their children and children were taught to lead the children who would come. I'm listening to a book on tape in the car. I never know what to say anymore. If you say you read the book and then somebody wants to borrow it, it's not a book. It's and so you say a book on tape, but it's really CDs on tape. And so, anyway, a little confusing. We got right to the a part I really wanted to hear the other day, and it started skipping. Just as Lincoln, I'm, re, I'm, I'm listening to, um, um, oh shoot, I hear it every day for weeks now. I'm listening to Team of Rivals. It's about Abraham Lincoln and how he was elected and how he chose his competitors to be part of his cabinet and they became part of his team and they were effective together. Um, But we got right to the point where Lincoln was going to be nominated for president in Chicago and it wouldn't play. Anyway, Lincoln was a great model of leadership. It's amazing the details he was involved in. It's amazing the way he educated himself. But you know, in those days, they didn't campaign like people campaign today. When he was nominated, he didn't give another speech. He didn't travel. It was up to other people to go out and share the message in the platform of his party. And there were person after person who were accomplished people who took their sphere of influence and they did whatever they could to lead people to make Lincoln their choice. Him being elected was the result of many, not one. And it may be easy to think that because your life isn't as impressive as somebody else's. I think most of us wish we could play and sing like James. Isn't that right? I mean, wow. We love it, right? But we can't. But we can do what we can do. And we can have the influence we can have. And that's important. It's important in the world to understand that God did not create you without purpose. Say, well, I don't know what my purpose is. You know what? Sometimes your purpose is just to be honorable, just to be Christian, just to be sincere, just to go through life dealing with what's in front of you and doing what's right. And you know what? Without those people, churches don't do well. Businesses don't do well. Communities don't do well. Countries don't do well because everybody can't be an Abraham Lincoln. Protecting a child. Now that's a great mystery, right? From the time a child is old enough to smart off, they're ready to tell you they want their freedom, right? They don't need you to tell them what to do. They don't need you to tell them how to do it. And uh, they can find colorful and aggressive ways to tell you you're wrong. So protecting them and getting them to go along with it can be a great challenge. But as you consider that, I I want you to realize this. I believe that our society and our families are not asking enough of our children from the parent side, okay? The Bible describes us as trainers. If you read history of accomplished people, uh, when children were young, they knew three languages. They'd learn Latin, and they'd learn Greek, and they'd learn English, or they'd learn German, and they worked. And we read Little House on the Prairie and stories like that, and they're so good and they're so great, but realize at the time that was written, girls were getting married at 13, boys were running farms at 15. So is it any wonder that children chafe at the authority of their parents? I don't say that as a bad thing. I think it's part of them to understand that they're capable of more. 
And I think we want to be training children and encourage them to look forward and realize they're capable of more than just bad behavior. They're capable of more than just being irritable and cranky, and they're capable of more than just playing video games and watching TV, and they won't suddenly get that. They get that gradually through life. But here you see Miriam protecting her brother. It says when his mother could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with pitch and slime and put the child in it and laid him in the river. I have a suspicion God told him to do that. I don't know, but it just seems that way. How else would you know to put him in the river? But how that must have taken great faith. There were crocodiles in the river. As you know, we went to Florida, and I liked Florida in some ways, but you know, just about everywhere we went that was pretty that I would want to be, where there was, a, there was water, there was a sign that said, be careful for the alligators. Now, I'm the kind of guy, if you put a fishing pole in my hand on a nice day and sat me beside the lake and let me fish, I'm going to do one thing probably more often than any other, and it isn't catch fish. You wanna, who wants to guess what it is? I'm going to sleep, man. I'm there to relax. I'm not really there to torture the fish. I mean, if they come to me, that's fine. I'll eat them. But, <laughs> but I don't want to wake up with an alligator on my leg. Alligator could have eaten that baby, or a crocodile in the Nile it would have been, not an alligator. And yet mom has the faith and the wisdom to prepare a basket and make sure it won't leak and set him loose on the Nile River. Wow. That was protecting him. I want to take just a couple of minutes and talk to you about the process of protecting your children as they grow up. And, and I believe these principles are effective for grandparents and aunts and uncles and you just have to figure out how to apply them. This isn't exhaustive by any means. This is something we could talk about for hours and days. And uh, if you think by saying these things that I think parenting is easy, please rethink that because I think parenting is the great challenge of the day, especially in a culture that is not supportive of your parenting. So, so often the relationship between parents and children becomes one of, well, you didn't do the right thing, so I'm punishing you. Or they didn't like what you asked them to do or you told them they couldn't do and so they're mad and so they're being punished. When a parent falls into a pattern of punishing, they need to realize that they need to spend more time getting the child on their team. They need to spend more time working on the bond Biblical parenting is training ahead of the problem, not scolding and correcting after the problem. When children show you there's a problem, don't be unhappy. Be glad because then they're showing you what they need. Their choices are going to be different than yours. Now I know none of you ever had any differences with your parents, right? (laughs) Sure you did. How old were you when you first remember disagreeing with your parents? Anybody? Okay, young, right? But it got easier when you became a teenager and you were just compliant, right? Of course not. Got to give kids positive options. Now, when your child comes home and says, hey, there's a big party out in that vacant farm And all my friends are going this Saturday night, and I want to go. I'll be in by 1 or 2 o'clock. And you say, nope. And they say, but all my friends are going. And you say, all your friends? Well, not all my friends, but most everybody's going. Well, okay, who's going? Well, Jason's going. And that's all your friends? Well, no, but I want to go. No, we're not going to do that. Now, if you make the mistake of grumbling about kids wanting to do 
destructive things and doing things that they shouldn't do. You're forgetting that you used to want to do those things, and a lot of us did them, right? I sure did. Any opportunity to make a bad choice, I almost always made it. And I, I'm not happy about that now, but when we knew something big was going on and it was going to be important to one of the kids, we would try to create an activity. Hey, how about if we get four of your friends and we do this that you like to do or we do that that you like to do? And so instead of them feeling a void, they can feel, hey, dad's not my adversary, mom's not my adversary. They understand I want to have fun. They understand that I want to be with my friends. They want to understand that I want to do something that somebody can think is cool. One time Mary took a carload of girls and I took a carload of boys and we went to Great America. And uh, on the way there, I let them pick the radio station and the Beatles came on. And I started singing with the Beatles. I forget which song. And, and uh, one of Jeffrey's friends, Zach, who we saw in Florida, he said, Mr. Kester, how do you know our music? <laughs> oh, okay. Your music. Remember who you were. Remember that you were not always compliant. Remember that you were not always easy. Remember that there were times you worked hard to fool your parents. How many of you ever worked hard to fool one of your parents? Come on, don't lie. You never worked hard to fool your parents. Wow, you're better than me. Children are sinners. I, I'm amazed at, at classmates of mine that I know, and I know how they behaved, and they will sit and adamantly insist, my child would never do that. Who are they kidding? Now, this is not an insult, but theologically, they're just sinners like you're a sinner, and, and they're going to be pushed to make bad choices. And if you are caustic and combative with them, if you're negative with them, that's corrosive to your relationship. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've pointed out something good that somebody's child has done, and their response is, well, they don't act like that at home. They just embarrass me everywhere we go. Would that work on you? Would that help you? You know, it's gotten too easy to be flippant. I saw a t-shirt once that said, I'm the dad, that's why. Well, that's persuasive to a teenager, right? How about, children should be seen and not heard. How about, do as I say, not as I do. All those things are inspirational, aren't they? They're easy. You know, we're commanded not to provoke children to anger. So we have to struggle to figure out how, what it means to fulfill our responsibility to teach them and train them and to not make them angry all at the same time. Again, if anybody thinks that's easy, you've lost your mind. Nobody that's ever worked at it thinks it's easy. But you know what? We all love our child. What we need to do is let that love motivate us to take measures to protect them like Moses' mother did with Moses. So Miriam, the sister, she has two obvious qualities here. They don't name her in the story, but we know that's who it was. She was a little older, and she was a pretty formidable individual too. And that would have been true of a lot of the Hebrew kids, because they were taught generationally how to function, how to have confidence, how to accomplish things. First quality is she loved her family. Egypt would have been a land full of risk. And yet she goes along the shore where there would have been snakes. Now I'll confess this to you. I, I'm, I'm almost 62. And uh, if I'm mowing the lawn and a snake goes in front of me in the mower and I can't get him with the next push, I'm going in the house. That's how I feel about a snake. I feel worse about a snake than I felt about those alligators. 
She loved her family. She wanted to take care of her brother. You know, sibling relationships develop best when parents guide children in the development of their skills. Let me be clear. When your children fight, you shouldn't say, oh, that's what kids do. You should help them develop skills to where they resolve their differences effectively. Now, if you have a four-year-old and a five-year-old, and I don't know anybody here that does, so I'm not picking on you, but if you have a four-year-old and a five-year-old and they're fighting, which one of them is the mature one? What? Can't hear you. Neither one. They're not ready to go find a solution to their conflict. They want to hit each other with that toy. Oh, just let them work it out. So we think if we let them practice bad habits, it's going to make them close? I'm not picking on anybody today, by the way. I just think this is important. Immaturity tends to destroy more than it builds on its own. Immaturity needs direction. That's why children have parents, and that's why they have Sunday school teachers, and that's why they have pastors, and that's why they have teachers, and all of us have a leadership role in their lives. Second, she had poise. She knew to keep her distance. She knew when to be quiet. She knew how to follow and protect herself. She was assessing the situation, and she wasn't very old. She's just a few years older than Moses, and he's a baby in a basket floating in the river. And here she has poise. I believe we need to have concern that children are developing a sense of how to conduct themselves, even in challenging situations. speaks of Pharaoh's daughter. She was a leader also. She saw the child and she wept and she had compassion. Compassion's a wonderful quality in somebody who wants to be a leader. And she said to the sister, or the sister said to her, shall I go and get a nurse? She waited for just the right time. Oh, she likes the baby. I know who that is. Let's see if we can get a nurse. Now, again, children are seldom born with poise. Now, they're cute sometimes, but that's not the same as having self-control and deliberate behavior. That gets taught. The control that poise brings give children the... Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. The control that poise brings to you gives children opportunities to accomplish under pressure. You know, I, I hesitate to say this because I, I'm troubled over these school shootings. And I know that there's no one right answer to preventing them. I wouldn't pretend to say anything like that. But one of the difficulties that we have in our society today is children are not being taught to experience pressure and react positively to it. Now, thankfully, the children at the Dixon High School responded to what they'd been taught. They'd been drilled. If ever this happens, you do this. The school teacher who was with them obviously had thought out ahead of time what should be done, and he had poise, and he did it. And the children were protected. And I know that as we sit here today, we're all so thankful for that. But I feel sorry for those kids who do not have controls, who think the answer is in a gun, or a knife, or a bomb, or a swear word, or a punch in the face. Now, I like this in the story. This is the daughter of Pharaoh. She probably has everything at her fingertips that a woman in her time could, could think of. 
and she realizes she can't provide for every need of her child. You know, I don't care who you are. You need other people in the life of your child. You need good people in the life of your child. I'll tell you something else you need. You need to have friends that will be honest with you about your child. If the only thing you can hear is, oh, he's such a good little boy, she's such a good little girl, you're going to need help. But Pharaoh's daughter said, I can't feed him. I can't take care of him. Find somebody. Find me some help. This is Andrew Carnegie, the railroad magnet who was wealthy and did so many things good and a few things that were rascally, but, you know, if we study history, honestly, none of these people are perfect. But he said, no man will make a great leader who wants to do it all himself or get the credit for doing it. Pharaoh's daughter doesn't seem to have a sense of that. She doesn't think herself so important. She can't ask a Hebrew slave woman to help. And together, they raise Moses. If you're going to be a person of influence, you want to welcome the good influences of others. Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. I always thought that was a funny part of the story. Do you think the child's own mother would have complained about having to take care of him? Of course not. Hey, lady, you let him go down the river in faith. She doesn't know that. God does. But, hey, we're bringing you back. I'm going to pay you to take care of him. How many of you would like to be stay-at-home moms with a substantial stipend to go with it? That wouldn't be so bad, right? And the child grew and she brought him into Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son and she called his name Moses because I drew him out of the water. The mother also recognized she could not be every influence. But she did the best she could in the time she had because she loved her child and was committed to her child. So you have these parents. You have this sister. You have Pharaoh's daughter, and again you have the mother all functioning at different times, doing different things in order to be people of influence. Now, I don't think they walked around saying, oh, I'm going to be somebody, I'm going to be a person of influence. Someday somebody's going to write the story of Moses and everybody's going to know who I am and what I did. No. It was just that's what's important in life. And so they persevered. And we all need to persevere to practice leadership and influence among those we can influence. And those are unsung leaders for today. Without all those people who supported Abraham Lincoln, would we have an Abraham Lincoln? And without all the people who, will support Mo who supported Moses, would we have had a Moses? And without those people who will support your child or without you who will support someone else's child, will we have the children we need to have? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the way you love us. Thank you that your word reminds us of practical issues and that we can talk about them. May they give us courage. May they give us examples that can inspire us. And may we be people who determine that my life will not be wasted. My life will be spent in good influences. And I will be your servant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.